Okay, we've been looking at the things that tend to trigger hopelessness and how the wording of the model prayer given by Christ answers some of those triggers. Loneliness answered by the fact that we have a father. The loss of control answered by the fact that God is always hallowed. He is the priority of all things. No purpose answered by the kingdom coming. Grief being answered by God's eternal purpose in all things. When we feel like we lack something, we have the promise of God to supply our daily need. When wrongdoing, we uh, are gifted with forgiveness and we gift others with forgiveness as well. And last time we talked about the fact that when we are wounded, we can conform to God's way and be healed. So those are some of the things that we have examined thus far. Which brings us to this phrase in the Lord's Prayer, and do not lead us into temptation. I want to spend some time unpacking that. Um, I don't think I put this in here, but just last year, June, the leader of Catholicism decided he did not like that phrase. And so he had it altered and it raised quite a hubbub to change the Lord's prayer. The reason he had it changed is because he said it sounded like God was leading people to do evil, pushing people to do evil. And in his uh, reasoning, God is a God, a father of love who would never push people towards doing evil. So he tweaked the Lord's prayer. Nothing in any manuscript verifies or substantiates his particular tweak, but nonetheless, uh, he did that. So it does, however, present an interesting thing for us to consider, and that is, what does that mean? Lead us not into temptation. And so we're going to spend some time trying to unpack that statement and maybe understand better what's involved in that. So first, I want to understand this. God has a relationship with evil. There is a relationship between God and evil. First impressions of this phrase may lead us to think that God is involved in tempting his children to do evil. However, such does not fit because God's desire is for us to be holy as he is holy. And so it isn't God's desire for us to do evil. Peter says, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. It also doesn't fit because of what James says, God doesn't tempt anybody. God is not involved in tempting people to do wrong. And James makes that just very plain. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God. Why not, James? For God is not tempted by evil and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So God is not involved in tempting us to do evil. And that leads us to the third thing that I want to notice about God's relationship with evil. And that is God does allow trials which give opportunity to choose between evil or holiness. He does allow, present, sometimes maybe even discipline by a trial so that we are, uh, we are put in a choice to decide whether we're going to be obedient or disobedient, whether we're going to choose good or whether we're going to choose evil. And just to list a few of the Bible characters, that this is very obvious in what we find recorded about their lives. Job, <laughs> who can question with the discourse that God has with Satan, who can question that God decided to allow Job to be tried to see if he would choose good or evil? How about Abraham called upon to sacrifice that one son that he was promised, that he waited for, that didn't come, finally arrives, and now he's supposed to kill him on an altar. Again, talk, uh, talk about being tried. Talk about making a choice between good and evil. Joseph, 
Moses, David, Paul, Jesus. Scripture is filled with example after example of God allowing trials to come upon people and put them in a situation where the choice to obey or disobey becomes theirs. God's reasons for allowing trials include to demonstrate his power. To demonstrate his power. Satan couldn't touch Job, right? Until God gave him that permission. God's power is demonstrated in trial. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Also to prepare one for service. One of the quotes I read, I can't remember who it was by now. This guy said, it's war that makes generals. And he, the comparison was, it's the battles that we have, it's the trials that we have that, that make us mature, that make us grow, that advance us in our Christian warfare. One of the examples of this, Jesus goes and is baptized of John, and then he goes by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. To prepare Christ for service, he was tested. He was tried. Sometimes God allows those trials as a preparation for service. We would find also that sometimes God allows trials to sanctify his followers. Trials don't cause, but they reveal. And so we count it all joy when we encounter various trials because the testing of our faith produces endurance. And when endurance uh, completes its work, we become mature and complete. and We don't lack anything. So sometimes God allows trials as a means of sanctifying those who are following him. And fourthly, sometimes God allows trials to focus upon the rewards that he's going to give. We have a trial because it, it puts our vision on what he is offering us. Peter, writing to, very, uh, writing to Christians during a time of great trial, says, You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to be distressed by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes, though refined by fire. <laughs> so he's talking about trial. And then he says this, May result, what? in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Trials bring us into focus with the great rewards that God offers us. And then lastly, sometimes God allows trials as a means of discipline. And Hebrews chapter 12 makes this so plain that the Lord disciplines the one that he loves. So those are some reasons why that when we look at God's relationship to, to evil, there are times when he allows a trial to commit evil because of any number of reasons, and we've talked about five of those. God desires for us to be holy, not evil. God does not tempt anyone to commit evil, and God does allow trials of evil within his children to show his power, to prepare for service, growth, to see his rewards, and sometimes as a means of disciplining his children. As we continue to ask, what did Jesus mean when he told us to pray that we not enter into temptation? I think the second thing I would want us to think about is the fact that God's leadership is talked about in Scripture abundantly. The fact that God is leading. The idea of his leading is a primary theme through all of Scripture. And just witness that in some of these passages. Psalm chapter 5. Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my adversaries. Make your way straight before me. What's the psalmist saying? God leads. He is beseeching God to lead in such a way that is straight because his adversary is putting these temptations, these trials before. So actually, this psalm is the opposite of what Jesus was saying. God, make my path straight. Psalm 27. Because of my adversary, show me your way, Lord, and lead me on a level path. Do not let me be, uh, do not give me over to the will of my foes or false witnesses. Rise up against me, breathing violence. So, again, God, 
Make my path straight. Lead me in a level path. Psalm 143, let me experience your faithful love in the morning, for I trust in you. Reveal to me the way I should go, because I long for you. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord. I come to you for protection. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me on level ground. Again, asking God for his leadership on a, on a level path. We get to the New Testament. For this reason also, since the day that we've heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? So that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Being led by the knowledge, by the wisdom, by the understanding of spiritual things. Because we're asking God to lead. And how about 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken us, but what is common to man, humanity. And God is faithful who will not allow us to be what? Tempted beyond what we're able to bear. God is leading. And this passage lets us know his leadership keeps us from areas where that we can be conquered by evil. That's his promise. Okay, so let's get to this. <laughs> Asking God for strength to avoid surrendering to my weaknesses. Lead us not into temptation. Part of what the crux of that phrase in this prayer is that we're asking God to keep us from our area of weakness. This is really what Jesus is instructing us to pray. God, lead me toward faithfulness during times when my weakness makes me vulnerable to this trial. This is the gospel according to Dan Fraser, so you can agree or disagree. But as I've had some time to think about this, I, I really believe that the reason that this is a part of the Lord's teaching on prayer is because for me to pray for God to not lead me into temptation I must be fully aware of where my weakness lies in other words before I can pray that to God I need to know where it is for me now, as I sought to make some application of that, some of those characters I talked about earlier, how would their situations have changed had they been praying to God about their weakness? Might it have been different if when all of the strong soldiers of Israel were off doing battle and David stayed back behind? How might the story have been different if David was saying, God, you know I have a problem lusting after women. And don't lead me in a, in a way that's going to tempt me. Had David been praying that, gone up on his rooftop, looked over and saw Bathsheba, do you think he might have thought things through a little differently? And that's why I think some of the reason that Jesus asked us to pray this is because he's saying, look at what your weaknesses are. God, don't lead me in a situation where I'm going to be tempted to listen to some juicy morsel of gossip about somebody because, you know, I can hardly keep my mouth shut once I get that stuff. If that's what I'm praying and I walk up to Dan and Dan says, hey, guess what, Sebastian? Whoa, just a minute. I don't want to go there. Do you see, do you see what I'm saying? If we are praying our weakness, we automatically are going to be different about that trial, about that temptation. We're going to view that much differently. So, there, that was going to preach it. Praying this phrase means that one has engaged in sufficient self-evaluation so as to know what personal spiritual dangers are present within the trials being faced. Peter had not done that. You'll remember this instant when Jesus says, Simon, look out, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. Peter was oblivious. He had not been praying about his weakness of pride. Who had been praying for Peter? But I have prayed for you. That's Jesus. 
I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned back, what's that imply <laughs> when you've fallen? You, when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Well, here, here, here is how unprepared, how un <laughs> self examining Peter was. Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Oh, Peter, <laughs> before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter was oblivious to his weakness. Satan says, I want to, I want to sift you like wheat. Jesus intercedes praying for Peter because Peter doesn't understand. I think that's what this phrase, why this phrase appears in this prayer. Okay, I'm going to illustrate this, and to do it, I have to go, I have to go pre-COVID, okay, to make it make sense. Got this young mother, she's got two, she's got two preschool children, um, and she goes to the grocery store with both kids. Mom sees as she's walking down the aisle that she's approaching the candy aisle. She knows if she turns the cart down the candy aisle, something's going to happen. Two little children who are normally angels are going to turn into the most greedy two children that you've ever laid eyes upon. They will become whiny. They will become bossy. They will become selfish. Just that little trip down the candy aisle. So guess what mom does? Yeah, She doesn't go down the candy aisle. When Jesus said, pray that you don't enter into temptation, he's saying, Christian, you need to know what the candy is that tests your spirit. And you ask God to not take you down that aisle. Father, that's my weakness right now. I know it's my weakness. Don't lead me. And you know what? That's the promise of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God's not going to do that. But he's only not going to do that if I'm fully aware what the candy aisle is. And so if I tell him, if I'm asking him, don't lead me into a situation where my pride can take over because I'm so prideful. Don't lead me in a situation where I, can, I make rash judgments and I, I, I condemn people because that's my weak. Don't put me in those situations. If I'm asking God those things, I'm revealing myself to him, and I can trust that he's going to help me. We're actually asking God not to take our cart down that aisle. So we've been talking about these triggers of temptation. One of those is the pull of wrongdoing, the trial, the temptation. That, that's one of the things that makes us feel horrible about ourselves. It's one of the things that, that we lose hope over. And there's not a person sitting here who has not made a commitment to your spiritual person. I'm going to stop X. And found out that you didn't stop X. And you didn't go on your way rejoicing. Pretty soon we lose hope in our ability, which by the way, that's why we need Christ. That's why we need grace, is because we don't have the ability. But you know what I'm talking about. We, we allow that to, to cause us to lose our hope. But this whole idea, lead us not into temptation, is making us aware of our own weaknesses so that we're asking God to take the direction of our path. Father, this is my weakness. This is a trial I struggle with. Keep me out of that path. Keep me away from that candy aisle. So here's some closing thoughts about this phrase in the prayer. I think we learn from this that we should never lean on our own strength. Whoever thinks he stands, be careful lest you fall. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. We need to never put ourselves into tempting situations on purpose. You know, if we do that, 
it's obvious we really don't know the nature of our own weakness to continually put ourselves in those kinds of situations. We had a, a gal that lived with us for a while who had been through treatment for chemical dependency. Actually, she'd been through three different treatment centers. I think most of a year she'd spent in treatment. She came to live with us as part of a program to find her way back into a social setting. I'll never forget sitting in Bible class teaching the teenagers and talking about, you know, if you don't, if you don't want to sin, don't put yourself in sinful places. And here's Gretchen, who is 16 years old, looks like she's 21, and has the life experience probably of a 30-year-old. And, of course, the young people, the teen classes, they're wanting to argue with me. Yeah, but I can go there and, you know, I can, I can still live for Jesus. I can still show Christ when I, you know, when I, I go to my friend's house and we're having this beer party. I can still show Jesus. And finally, Gretchen interrupts and she goes, Guys, if you don't want to slip, don't put yourself in slippery places. Not another word. A 16-year-old who knew that lesson by experience, they would listen to. <laughs> you know, a 30-something teacher, and eh, they could care less. But you know what? We need to learn from this prayer, this phrase in the prayer. We, we don't put ourselves in situations that are going to tempt us. That's foolishness. Oh, and, and what a great example of that Joseph is. You know, he's got, he's got Potiphar's wife, and she's coming on to him, strongly coming on to him. What does he do? He runs. He doesn't stand there. You know what? I, I'm serving Jehovah God. I can stand here and just, just let her put all the pressure she wants because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be faithful. No, he knows better. David had been a lot better off had he followed Joseph's advice. But he didn't. Another thing we need to consider is how we may lead someone else into temptation. If we're unaware and being unrealistic about our own weaknesses and our own trials, we can easily lead somebody else astray. I'm impressed, and I didn't put it up here, but I'm impressed with the way that when Paul wrote to Timothy, he gives specific instructions to younger men to treat the younger women like sisters. What's that about? Well, he's saying, you've got to be careful because you might be leading somebody else astray. Now, when you sin like this against brothers and wound their weak consciences, you are sinning against Christ. Paul says, if food causes my brother to fall, I will never eat meat so that I won't cause my brother to fall. You need to be serious when it comes to trials and weaknesses. I would like for us to end today by reciting this. I mean, isn't this just getting more and more powerful? This is not just a recitation of how we should pray. This is how we should live. This is how the truth of God conquers the hopelessness of the human condition. This is immensely powerful. I would like for us to stand and we'll read this together. And then uh, the individual who's been selected to lead our, our dismissal prayer uh, can do that. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.